My uncle died 10 years ago. Him and my auntie were on holiday in Egypt, cruising on a ship that day, going snorkeling, and he had all of a sudden got up and left my auntie without a word while they were preparing to snorkel, went to the edge and jumped in. They were incredibly close, and my auntie thought it was very odd of him to do that, but 10 minutes later, they found out he was dead. The autopsy revealed that he had a heart attack, but also drowned. It's been 10 years, and my aunt is still not fully over it. She was on antidepressants for many years. She cried so much that her skin under her eyes was raw. Three years ago, I had this dream. I was standing in this weird place. There was a corridor in front of me. Sort of, if one of the walls of the corridor was missing, so I could see what was happening. There was this swaying double door on one end and hundreds of people passing through the corridor and through the door. When the door swayed open, there was an incredible light in there. I knew that those people were souls, people who passed away. Now every time they had gone through the door, they were thrown back to the beginning of the corridor, over and over again. It felt like an old video cassette being stuck repeating the same snip. Walking among those souls was my uncle, being constantly thrown back, walking again and again. This carried on maybe 30 times when he spotted me standing by. I could see that he was in a complete and utter shock, seeing me there and had the saddest look on his face I've ever seen. It pierced my heart. After a while, he strayed away and came up to me, grabbed my shoulders by both hands, tears running down his face saying, you have to help me, I don't belong here. I'm not supposed to be here. I asked, what is this place? He then replied, please, tell auntie that I love her so much and that I miss her, please. I then pointed at the door and asked, what's behind that door? At this point he became sort of angry, stepped away a bit, pointed a finger at me and shouted, you're not supposed to know that. At that point, this entity flew in between me and him and with the biggest force threw my whole body away. I couldn't see its actual form, but it looked like a grey shadow. I knew it was a demon, or somewhat of a demonic form, and the anger that was radiating from it was the worst I've ever experienced. It was so pissed off, and it shouted at me, How did you get here? How were you allowed to witness this? This is not for you to see. Who let you in here? The voice was not human. He then told me, telepathically, that I have to pay for witnessing what I had witnessed, and he threw me into this marsh. I knew that I had a choice. I was given a choice. Either I drown and stay where I was, among the other souls, or fight. I could feel the mud rising to my chest, then to my neck and mouth. I've never in my entire life fought for this much for my life. It took absolutely everything in me to try and get out of there, and when I pulled everything I had in me, I saw a little round window that appeared on this wall. I pulled myself towards the window and squeezed through, and at that very moment, I woke up. I got an instant migraine, the biggest migraine I've ever had in my life. The pain was excruciating and ran all the way up and down the back of my head. I felt like somebody beat me with a baseball bat. I only then found out that this place is called Purgatory in mythology and apparently guarded by demons. I lit a candle for my uncle sent him to the light, but I still have this on my mind as I feel he's still stuck there for some reason. I've also never passed the message to my aunt. I don't have the heart to do it. Considering how much she's been through, to reopen the wound in her, I just can't. I would really appreciate any suggestions and opinions. I live in London, and a few years ago, I went on a business trip to Venice with a few people from work. I shared a room with one of the girls that was on the same trip, and the first night, I went to sleep before her, and she stayed with some other colleagues in the hotel bar downstairs. I switched the lights off and went to bed. A few minutes in, I had sensed and heard this vibrating sound all around my bed. I might have been astral projecting, as I've had that many times before, but these vibrations were different. Not in my body, but actually around it, and coming from the outside surrounding my bed. Then I heard my colleague coming to the room as she turned the lights on, which actually woke me up and grabbed something from a drawer and left again, but left the lights on. 
I got irritated but was too tired to get up to switch them off, so I fell asleep. I woke up hours later and the sun was up already, and as I turned, I noticed she still wasn't back. I thought to myself, holy shit, she probably stayed out drinking and will be out of it the next day, but couldn't care less and went back to sleep. My alarm went off at 8am and when I got up, she was there asleep. I laughed it off thinking she must have literally just got back and so I went to take a shower. And now the bathroom door was locked from the inside. It was these sliding doors that could only be locked from the inside as they had no lock on the outside. I was rattling with it for quite some time and it woke my colleague up so I said sorry you must have got in bed and she gave me a weird look like huh? So I told her about her coming in at night, turning the lights on and then going back out. She went, what are you talking about? I literally came up like 20 minutes after you and went to sleep and the lights were on and so I thought you left them on and I went to sleep. I was here the whole night. I mean, what the fuck? We had to use a knife to unlock the bathroom door and were both puzzled how that could happen as there was no chance of locking the door from the outside as it had no knob. We then went downstairs to have a breakfast and told this experience to the other colleagues and none of them who slept in another room with someone else said their single beds were pushed together in the morning. But when they went to sleep, there was about a six foot space in between them. My husband and I moved into this house or flat about one and a half years ago. Anyway, the first day we moved in, I thought that there was something not right. The energy was just so off. I told my husband, but he just didn't pay attention to it all, as he's not into anything spiritual. The first night, I dreamt that I was in this massive warehouse. There was this blonde woman standing, looking up, and a snowflake was slowly falling from the sky and landed on her forehead. That snowflake turned into a pentagram and turned upside down. She then twisted herself, bending backwards, so her head was on the floor. And she started chasing me and screaming at me, You can't break the devil! She kept screaming that over and over, and I kept running through the warehouse, but kept ending up in the same spot. So basically, been running in circles. She running backwards after me. There were these hooks that you find in slaughterhouses to hook pigs on, and she wanted to hook me on one of them. I woke up so insanely drained, like never in my entire life, and my husband had a dream about people committing suicide, hanging themselves under the bridge and jumping off a bridge, and mind you, he never gets bad dreams, so he thought that was weird too. From that day on, I literally felt like there was something sucking my life out of me. I couldn't wake up in the morning, I couldn't get out of bed, even after 10 or 12 hours of sleep. I felt like I hadn't slept for months. It was getting worse and worse each day. I felt like the walls of the flat were closing into me when I was there. I was so sad and depressed, but felt better when I was out. My marriage started falling apart. I kept sensing a woman crying, looking out of the window, and a little boy sitting there on the floor. Everyone so scared and sad, the walls closing in. Something kept taking me back. I felt the word back back, back. I couldn't figure it out until about a month in. I was just walking home in the evening and we live in this complex of flats so I was walking in the complex and I had a vision so clear. I went back in time and ended up in the second world war. Everything around me looked similar yet different. I knew it was the second world war as the houses looked like they were bombed. The vision lasted about two seconds but felt like an eternity. I ran home in a complete and utter shock and immediately got on the internet. And what I had found was shocking, but at the same time made so much sense. The complex that we lived in was badly bombed during the Second World War and the whole area, Bethnal Green, London, was the worst bombed area in London. There was a statement from a lady who lived next door from us saying that she tried to run out of the house and there were dead bodies everywhere. It just suddenly clicked. It was the word, back. It was depression, the walls closing onto me, the anxiety and sadness. 
the little boy sitting in the corner fearing for his life. So is his mother. There's also an energy or entity of a man with massive hands. He once came to the bathroom while I was showering. The clothes that I hung started moving on their own, and then I sensed his presence. Yet he wasn't staring at me, because I was naked. There was nothing sexual about it. There was just so much sadness. So much that I almost started crying. He just stood there, his head down. I couldn't see him, but sensed everything. I cleansed this place about five to six, six times thoroughly, with salt, white sage, opened windows, doors, and everything else. Draws anything that can have trapped energy, basically while cleansing it. And lit up white candles and prayed for those who either suffered there or died, and send them to the light with love. The entire energy of the house had changed completely. So sometimes, that we perceive as evil, it might not be. It's just trying to get your attention, begging for help. This happened when I was 19, so almost 20 years ago. At that time, I was still living in my parents' house. My room was in the attic. My brother's room was across from me, and my parents' bedroom was downstairs. It was Wednesday night. I went to sleep, so I turned the lights off and went to bed. But as soon as I got in the bed, I stood up and turned the lights back on. Absolutely no idea why I did that. Went back to bed, sat in it and waited. Not sure how else to describe it or the way I was acting. Within a minute, it came in through the closed door. The door was behind me, but I felt it. It had completely and utterly overpowered me. I became paralyzed. I literally cannot find the right words to describe it, as nothing will ever come close. But it was the most sinister, foreboding, evil, penetrating every cell in your body. Your mind, your soul. The evilness that was coming in from it was inhuman. So profound and sickening, I really can't find the words. It was coming closer and closer. I could feel it, but couldn't look at it. I could feel my tears rolling down my face, but couldn't scream or move. At one point, it grabbed my chin and held my face straight so I couldn't turn. I felt the hand, but it wasn't a human hand. It was bigger and felt different. Then I remember that it pushed me down by my chest. I was still sitting at that point, onto the bed, and only remember one fragment of what happened next. I lost my identity. That's the closest I could possibly describe it. I didn't know who I was, what my name was, where I was, nothing. I really don't know what went on afterwards and whether I fought it. The next moment that I remember is that I'm sitting in bed in the same position as earlier, rocking back and forth and looking at the window in front of me. I think I lost it at that moment. I was just there, staring at the window. The sunrise came up. I saw the sun rays coming through the blinds. I heard my parents getting up and going to work and I didn't move. I was just there, totally lost. My mum got home from work around four and that was the first time I managed to get up and go downstairs. She said, hi, you okay? You had the light on all night. I went down on my knees and broke down. I grabbed her around her legs and cried uncontrollably. I just couldn't stop. She was so concerned and wanted to take me to the hospital, but I managed to calm down a bit. I remember my pupils were so dilated over the whole day that I literally felt scared of my own reflection. I met up with a friend later on, but she said she felt scared and uneasy in my presence. Until this day, when I go to visit my parents, I sleep in my brother's room. I don't know whether it has something to do with the actual place, or if it came specifically for me and why. Since I was a child, I've always had sensed the other realm and been very in tune and highly sensitive, but I sensed that there was more to it, like a reason why it happened, but I cannot retrieve the whole situation, no matter how much I've tried. When I was little, I played with a little girl named Christina. We did everything together, and she was my best friend. She even came with us when we went to another country. We played on the swing and pushed each other, and one time, 
she made me cut my own hair. It wasn't just a little bit of hair that I cut off. It was almost everything, and I got in so much trouble. I also remember that one time she had the most horrific pants. They were bright orange Manchester pants, but one of the time she wore a dress. She had long wavy hair and always wore it in a half up hairstyle. My family thought I was crazy playing with her, and I didn't understand why until years later. Then we stopped hanging out when I was about 10 or 11 years old. Then years later, my mom saw her. My mom came out from the bathroom, and there she was, right outside the door. As soon as she saw her, she disappeared. My mum rushed to my room to tell me what she had seen and started to describe her. My reaction was, I've played with a ghost. That's why they thought I was crazy. They didn't see her. I was the only one who saw her then until my nephew was about five. He has seen her multiple times, but he starts to talk about other things and avoids talking about what he's seen. He isn't the only one who's seen her nowadays. We've gotten so used to her that we don't mind her being there. The medium told us that she isn't stuck here. She just likes to visit. My five-year-old son, who happens to be high-functioning autistic, has had several things happen over the years. Recently, they seem to be coming more frequent. The first time we noticed something was when he was about nine months old. We took a road trip and stopped off in Fall River, Massachusetts to tour the Lizzie Borden house. While there with the tour group, my husband was holding our son and we were the last ones to leave the parlor area. My son was looking over my husband's shoulder back into the empty room and started laughing, clapping and waving at the empty room. He was clearly some seeing something that we couldn't. Recently, he's been telling us he sees Jesus, and when asked what Jesus looks like, he says Jesus is a bright light. He says Jesus doesn't talk to him, but he's there. That has happened in a couple of different places. One day, out of the blue, he tells my husband and me he's hungry. We ask him who, and he says Jeremy. His brother's name is Jeremy. In college, the boys are 15 years apart, and we say Baba. He says no. Jeremy from Daddy's office. We're like, okay. Then less than three minutes later, my husband and I get a text on our group text with Jeremy from my husband's office. And it's a picture of his dinner that he just finished grilling. It was steak and veggies. The other night, my husband and son went to Sonic and got some grape slushies and chicken. I asked my son what he got, and he said chicken and tots. I was thinking about how good the DQ chicken salads used to be back in the day, but never said anything out loud, and all of a sudden my son says, maybe next time we can go to DQ. We've never taken him to DQ, ever. I asked my husband if I said anything about DQ, and he said no, he didn't. These just seem too coincidental to be coincidental. What do you think? When I was about 12 to 14, I used to see this white orb in my room at my parents' house. I would always see it at the start of the floor and shoot up into the ceiling. My mom was on the second floor. Now, I don't believe in ghosts or paranormal stuff, and I've always tried to figure out ways to explain it. I used to think that because my eyes were playing tricks on me, since my room was always dark. That all changed when my cousin from out of town came and was spending the night. As soon as I opened the door to my room to show her, she asked me, what was that white orb? After a while, I stopped seeing it. Since then, a lot has happened. I've moved out, then back in, then back out again. And now due to COVID, I had to move back and it's no longer my room. During a summer when I was 14, I used to have an urge to check the kitchen for anything. Like I know it sounds crazy, but I couldn't sleep till I stood in the kitchen in the dark and counted in my head till 10 or 20. I have no explanation for it. It just kind of happened. I remember I would sneak downstairs and just stand at the bottom of the stairs in the dark and quiet. Once, my aunt even caught me, and that was a hard thing to explain to her. Sometimes, I wouldn't even realize I'm doing it, and it just seems like a normal thing to me. 
I remember one time when I was a bit older, about 18, my parents went out of town and it was just me and my brothers home for the weekend. That night, my brothers went out with friends, so it was just me. I was upstairs playing games and it was about 2 or 3 a.m. when I decided to call it quits for the night. I got thirsty and decided to go downstairs into the kitchen for a cup of water. My basement doorway was inverted, the stairs and the kitchen. As I was walking past, I heard what sounded like a woman's voice singing. It wasn't in English and wasn't Vietnamese. So I thought maybe my brothers left the TV on or their computers on or something. I checked both of their rooms and nothing was on. My game was already off and I didn't have the courage to go check the basement. I was in my 30s when this happened. I'm a ticket collector on a train. I have to travel across my country for the sake of my job. It was the third or fourth week after I joined the post as a ticket collector. On reaching a destination, I thought of smoking as it is one of my bad habits. After a straight eight hour duty on the train, I needed it. As it was prohibited to smoke inside the train, I was feeling the terrible urge to smoke. On reaching the station, I undressed myself in my uniform and got myself in common attire in my room in the station itself that was given to me. It was only 10 p.m. and outside the shops were closed. I haven't bought any cigarettes till now, nor have I had a single one. I thought, how can I manage the whole night without it? So anyway, I have to find an open shop nearby. At 10.30 p.m. I left in search of a shop. I didn't find a single shop open nearby. Wandering here and there, I found a group of people going somewhere. I asked them why all the shops have been closed. They told me they're not native of this place and they have to catch the train. They hurried away. After walking for another 30 minutes in this small town, I got tired, but don't know why I don't give up. Maybe it's my addiction to smoking. After some time, I felt like where I will get my stuff. I know it and the roads are signalling me the right path. I didn't find a single shop in the town or village. I came much further walking from the station, nearly five to six kilometres. Now at least I've decided to return to my room in the station. I have to return home early in the morning by the same train I had come here. I felt extremely tired and I had to walk another five to six kilometres going back. On returning, I found an elderly couple with their children and a bag of luggage with them. They surely will be going to the station, I thought, and I should also join them helping them with their bags and the walk will be less boring. Their company will also be less frightened of robbers or thieves. Introducing myself was easy and they didn't show any discomfort while introducing themselves. They told me where they're from and where they're going. The man told me that this was his in-law's house and they're returning home. Their train was at 3.45 a.m. and now it was 2 a.m. I noticed my watch in my black and white keypad mobile and noted that I had walked almost three to four hours continuously for a single puff of a cigarette. It was 3 a.m. when I reached the station. The station asked me where I was. As I was new in this job, I feel hesitant to inform you that I smoke and it will be a red mark on my reputation. I slept for only two hours in my room at 5.30 a.m., hoping to find the shop, I came out and I found two or three shops open and went there. I asked the shopkeeper why the hell all the shops were closed yesterday so early. The words that came out of his mouth totally surprised me. He said their shops were open until 2 p.m. I asked another shopkeeper their answer and it was also the same. They told me that shops near the station were open until 2 the place might be a village or a small town, but the station is a junction with thousands of passengers passing by every hour. Suddenly, my phone rang. It was from home. It was my father. He said there was bad news. My friend since my childhood was no more. I was frightened more than being downcast. I felt myself freaking cold and ran towards my room and locked myself in. I caught my train at the scheduled time and calculated my puzzled experience, i.e. the relation between the death of my best friend and last night's experience, because he was the one who always hindered me on my smoking. 
You always told me to stop smoking. He's always been my barrier to my smoking. Some backstory. My mother has breast cancer. Not saying this to get sympathy points, just pointing it out for the story. Before our town got a cancer treatment center at the hospital, my mother would have to travel to a city four hours away to get treated. At times, this would be three days. She'd leave, get treated, and then come back on the third day. At this time, my brother was in his early teens and was going through that rebellious stage of his life. So guess who gets called to look after him when my mother does her treatment? Day one. My mother leaves early about six in the morning and tells me she would send me a text once she gets into her hotel. I, who came around yesterday so my mother could leave early, told her to have a safe trip. Eventually, my brother wakes to get ready for school. I give him his lunch and he's off. I spend my day just sitting around my mother's house, keeping her cat's attention, giving the dog some food, watching TV, the basics really. Sure enough, my brother returns back from school and we do the typical brother things. Night comes, he goes to bed, and I stay up for a while watching TV. About 10, I turned off and made my way to the spare room, where I was staying while mum was away. I get underneath the blanket and close my eyes. As I could feel myself on the verge of sleep, I heard it. Thud, thud, thud. The sounds of footsteps, like someone was quickly moving back and forth through the living room. My eyes shot open. My thoughts quickly went to burglar. Someone was in my mother's house, quickly moving around to find anything to steal. But as I listen, I notice something. I would hear it, then a pause, then again. Like someone was running back and forth, only stopping for a moment to do it again. The sound was too light for a grown person, but something more of a child. I sighed, believing this to be my brother. My mother had told me before she left how my brother would sneak out of his grab and phone or Game Boy and play it when he was meant to be sleeping. Believing this was the case, I got out of bed and made my way into the living room. As I did, the noise stopped. I continued on, up to my brother's room. I open the door and peek in. He looks like he's sleeping, but looks can be deceiving. Returning to the living room, I decided to pretend to have fallen asleep on the couch so I could catch my brother in action. Somehow I fell asleep. I awoke to something brushing my nose. Turns out it was the dog. I looked around to see the slightest of light coming in the windows. If I had to guess, it was maybe two or three in the morning. Tired, I get up and make my way back to my bed. Once again, as I felt myself about to drift to sleep, the noises started up again. In my tired state, I just noticed that there were possums on the roof and fell asleep. Day two. It was Saturday, so I let my brother sleep in. The lazy bastard didn't get up until 11. They went well, we hung out, had lunch, played some games, nothing really major. Well, not until that night. Once again, I stayed up while my brother went to bed and again, around 10, I turned off the TV and went to bed. Sure enough, as I was about to drift off, Thud, thud, thud. Those damn possums, I moaned to myself. Then I heard a little girl giggle. My eyes shot open after hearing that, and the running resumed. I sat up hearing the playful running back and forth in the living room. I just sat there trying to figure where the little girl giggle came from. It sounded like a seven to ten year old. I turned on the window, seeing the next door neighbor's light still on. I began to think the noise I was hearing was coming from them, that they had a little girl over and she was just being a pest. A good possibility, except for one thing. The couple who lived there were old and didn't have any grandkids. I heard that giggle again much clearer now, like it was just in the living room which was outside of my door. Needless to say, I didn't sleep that well that night. Day three. That morning I was uneasy, but was glad my mother was returning. About 1pm, she got back home and I began to pack up to return home by myself. But the events of the last two nights still stuck with me as I returned back to her. Getting the courage, I ask her if she ever heard a little girl at night. Oh her, my mother states. 
Yeah, she's quite a mischievous one, isn't she? I just smiled and left. I spent other nights there looking after my brother, but never heard from her again. And when my mother moved to another house, we have another ghost. This happened when I was a teen. I'm 26 years old now. This is important to mention because after all those years, I still feel bad if I think about that day. My parents decided to move and I went with them to look at some houses. The first two were okay, but not quite what my parents were looking for, since they wanted a house with a big backyard. The realtor decided to show them a newly vacant house. The owner was an old lady who had died and their sons decided to sell the house. My parents aren't superstitious or religious people, so we didn't see a problem with it. We arrived at the place, the realtor opened it, we entered the garage, everything was fine, until I went to the living room. I almost let out a gasp because the atmosphere was so oppressive, like there were invisible eyes everywhere observing and judging me. I felt like there was a weight on my chest. I couldn't even breathe properly. I left the room and went to the backyard to catch some air when I saw a small room connected to the back of the house. I entered it out of curiosity and saw it was a small empty room with humidity stains on the walls. Just when I was about to enter the room to see if there was anything interesting, something just figuratively punched my chest with so much sadness and anger, I almost ran screaming. I slammed the door and entered the house again, going to one of the empty bedrooms and sitting on the floor trying to catch my breath. I couldn't stay though, because the feeling of being watched or judged by numerous invisible eyes returned with even more intensity. At this point, I left the house to find my parents talking with the realtor in the front garden. I grabbed my mom by her arm and begged her to go home. After some awkward excuses, my parents finally went home. I didn't say a word during the way back, but when I arrived home, I just cried and cried and cried for hours. My parents got concerned and asked me what was happening and I just kept repeating, I don't know. I don't know, I'm feeling so sad. I felt like I'd never be happy again. I still think about that day and still get shivers. As I write this, the hair on my arms are standing up. Last thing I heard about the house is that someone else bought it and turned it into a restaurant. Long time ago, my mother at random and rare times would go on these drives. Her definition of a drive sometimes meant going from a town over an hour away to visiting a city st a state over. And I would sometimes join her on these trips when she called. And because, you know, I have nothing better to do. This happened on one of these many trips. We were returning back to our town that we both lived in. It was in the afternoon, two, maybe three and the weather throughout the day was fairly good with some clouds. We were going through a town where I used to go to school, where she turned to me and asked if it was alright we took a detour to check her then boyfriend's place and animals. I know these roads, so I just shrugged and said, sure. It was a 15 minute detour after all. So she turned off the main road and down a road I knew all too well. As I said, I used to go to school in the town we just passed and this road we were currently on was the road my bus would take. And after all those years, I still knew the road. I knew every corner, every bump, every hill. The road itself was somewhat small, enough room for two cars to drive on with ease. Anything bigger, well, someone was driving on the curve. So here we were on the same road I took when I went to school. The same road I dreaded so many times as we made our way down the road. I turned to ahead of us and in the direction we were going was a figure. From the distance we were at, I could see that it was a man, but more importantly, a farmer. If you could imagine the stereotype of what a farmer would look like, you'd be close to what he looked like. The wide brim hat, overalls, boots. As we got closer, I could see more detail about him and more red flags were just going off in my head. I could see the white hair, the color of the flannel shirt, him having one of the straps of the overalls off. However, he just looked off. 
His clothes look like something from the 60s or 70s. And second, he seemed to be oblivious to us. I thought he would turn to look at us or just walk slightly off the road to give us room, but he didn't. Soon, we were only mere feet away and I was focused on him. And as we passed him, my eyes followed him and as soon as he reached the side passenger window where I was at, he vanished. Completely evaporated right in front of me. I turned so hard to look behind me that I would have given myself whiplash. I was looking to see where he went. All I saw was the road. A single tree and the fence line to paddocks. No farmer anywhere. As I stare, questioning my sanity, I hear, you saw him too? I turned to my mother, asking if she saw a farmer. She responded with a yes. I then described what he looked like and again she confirmed it. She saw the same person as I did and I saw him vanish into thin air. Like I said, I've been on that road many times before and after this event and I've never seen him again. This was not my first time seeing a ghostly person and if anyone wasn't interested, I can retell some of those here of the many times my mother lived in a house with an extra person also living there. This happened to me when I was around six years old in the mid 90s. My father was a finished carpenter at the time and I went to work with him one day. He was working on restoring an old hotel called the Feather River Inn in Plumas County, California. The inn was built in 1915 and was also a preparatory school. It's now been vacant for a long time. At the time, I knew the inn had a history of being haunted or at least very spooky. My dad had told me about the place and about the stories he'd heard. He later had his own story. I was little at the time and didn't really think too much about it, but I remember I was excited to go and see it in person. The third floor was abandoned and was in really bad disrepair. I remember it being really dark and in shambles. Think any kind of old abandoned building. We went to the third floor to look around because there were really weird paintings in some of the rooms. They were painted in all black and white swirls like hypnosis circles. The crew imagined boys from the prep school probably drew them, but no one knew for sure. The strangest thing was they even found mummified cats in one of the walls up there. The second floor was where they were working that day. As we walked there, we passed colonies of bat balls on the ceilings. They were literal balls of bats all clinging together. The place was very eerie. So I remember the second floor was shaped like a big square with one hallway around the perimeter. The halls were very long. The part of the hall they were working in was in good shape and lit. There were other guys working all down this part busy doing things. I was standing at one end looking all the way down the hall. I realized someone was peeking around the corner at the other end of the hall. It was a woman. You can tell I was listed at the time because I just assumed it was the wife of one of my dad's crew members. She had long black curly hair, fair skin, dark eye makeup and dark clothes. She really resembled this man's wife so I excitedly started to wave at her. But she did wave back. This went on for a while and I felt really confused. I started to feel strange because no one else in the hall was reacting. She was just deadpan staring at me, so I reflexively turned to look behind myself. Maybe she was looking past me. When I turned back, she was gone. I thought this was weird, so I walked down the hall and turned the corner. When I looked down this part of the hall, it was totally black and all a mess. They hadn't even started working on this part yet. That's when I got pretty scared because it all sank in at once. I realized the position that the woman was standing in was not normal. You couldn't see her lower half at all from around the corner. It was like just her upper half was sticking out from around the side. At that point, I realized that her hair wasn't curly. It was just out of control. She wasn't fair skinned. She was basically pure white. Her dark makeup was actually just two big vacant holes of eyes. It's crazy looking back on this experience because it's like, what on earth was I thinking waving at that? It's also strange that it took a while for me to process how creepy she looked. I can still totally see her, 
and the whole experience in my mind's eye. I can't totally remember her expression, though. I think it was just blank or serious, not smiling. I can't remember what I did next, but I know I've talked about it with my parents in the past. Basically, everyone who has spent time there has had a strange experience. Whatever I saw, it was so vivid that I interacted with it. Any thoughts or ideas? About a year ago, I was in a very dark place, spiritually and emotionally. I rarely prayed. I had so many insecurities, worries and problems in my life. It was a struggle just to get day by day. It was at this period in my life I started to wake up to black demonic figures in my room almost every night. I can't remember when it started, but I remember the worst nights to this day. Usually, they show up either beside or at the end of my bed. Tall, sinister and blacker than black. I never had sleep paralysis and there was never anything in my room that could look like these things, yet I still saw them. It got so bad, I had to sleep with a flashlight next to my bed because the only way to get rid of them was to quickly shine my torch at them when I woke up. Usually, I'll wake up to one in my room which would freak me out on its own, but one night I woke up and saw three of them all surrounding my bed, all the same height and all facing straight towards me, not moving or talking, just watching. That terrified me. Now, all this can be explained rationally, right? Overactive imagination, or just being half asleep, right? Well, I have two reasons why I think these things are very real. I woke up one night seeing a smaller one, like a child, at the end of my bed. For some reason, I wasn't scared. I think it was because I was still waking up. I've never spoken to these things ever, but on that night, I did. I just said, I can see you, while looking towards it, and the creepiest thing happened. It started moving towards my desk and literally stood behind my desk as if it was trying to hide. Fucking crazy if you ask me. My other reason is earlier this year, some missionaries came to our place for dinner, and I asked them to bless the house and our family. After that, I never saw one in my room again. Call it coincidence. I don't think it is. I think those things were very real. I don't tell anyone in my family because I think they would be creeped out to say the least, and I don't want to scare them. When I first got with my girlfriend, she told me about a weird experience she and a friend had in Swansea, South Wales. She explained that she had seen a weird flock of shapes flying around the bay, just above the surface of the water. She firmly denied all of my suggestions as to what they could be. What about birds? No. What about flying fish? No. The shadows of birds? No. There are a lot of kite flies down on the bay. Was it the shadow of a complex kite? No. We discussed it for a bit and then moved on to other things. I thought nothing of it for another few years. Then one day, I'm down on the bay with a friend of mine. It's a bright, sunny afternoon. Swansea Bay has a large set of double-like concrete stairs that follow along the coastline for half a mile or so. Like amphitheatre seating. We were sitting on them chatting and looking out to sea, when my friend pointed out to the shallows. The sea was probably a couple hundred feet away, and said, What the fuck is that? I followed the direction she was pointing and saw a formation of a diamond shape. Objects. There were probably eight to twelve of them, each around a foot or a foot and a half, perhaps a bit bigger. They were translucent black, like smoked glass. They flew in a grid-like formation, moving as one object, with the occasional sliding shift from one position to another, always maintaining tessellation. They flew fast and sporadically, mechanically and I'd guess intelligently, zipping directly from one spot to another and stopping, hovering for a second and then zipping to another spot. While visible, they would stay a couple of feet to six inches above the ocean surface. Every now and then, they would seem to merge with the surface of the water and re-emerge somewhere nearby. They would zip over the surf where it was only an inch or two deep, 
On one occasion, they were right next to a guy walking his dog by the water's edge. The dude and his dog didn't react in any way. I have to assume they weren't visible to them. They never went past the edge of the sand. This lasted a good five minutes or so before they merged with the surface again and never came back. Every time I go down to the bay, I keep a lookout for them, as obviously it's a recurring phenomenon. I've never even heard of anything similar to this, so I've no frame or reference or any way of categorizing the experience. I really hope someone here has seen or heard of something similar. I probably still think about it a few times a week. This happened when I was about six years old, but I still remember it well. Like many kids that age, I was scared of the dark, so I often moved to lie with my head in the bed's foot end, as it allowed me to peek out the door and into the living room, where my parents usually watched TV after tugging me in. This particular night was no different. It was dark and quiet when I woke up. My parents must have gone to bed. Then I saw a slender woman who looked to be no older than 30. Her fair hair was long, almost down to her waist, and she wore a simple dress that reached her shins. She wasn't transparent, but she had this weird, faint glow, and she held her arms to her chest as if she was carrying a tiny infant. I knew instantly that it wasn't my mother who had short hair, almost a bobcat, and she never wore more than underwear to bed, maybe a t-shirt at most, but certainly not a long nightgown. Furthermore, my younger sister was a toddler at the time, far bigger than the infant-like thing that the woman was holding. She walked silently with a face directed down towards the infant, paying me no attention as she slowly made her way past my bedroom door. I knew it wasn't my mother, yet I felt absolutely calm despite my usual night terror. It was as if I recognised instinctively that this woman, whoever she was, was not a threat to me. And so I lied still, waiting for her to return and pass by my room again. She couldn't walk more than three or four steps past my door in the direction that she was going due to an old wooden dining table blocking the way. She couldn't even walk around it either. She would have to turn around, but no matter how long I waited, she never returned. In the end, I got tired and got out of bed to check it out. Nothing. There was no one in the living room, nor the kitchen. I even went to check on my parents who were sound asleep. Puzzled, I headed back to bed and eventually fell asleep. I asked my parents at breakfast the following morning who the lady from last night was, because I had never seen her before. Had they held a late get-together? But my parents had no clue about what I was talking about, and I ended up just shrugging it off. I never saw her again, but my fear of the dark ended soon after, as if the encounter had somehow assured me. And more than two decades later, I still feel her presence in the house. My parents and sisters have noticed it too, although they've never seen her. Sometimes we all joke about it, except for my sister, who feels uncomfortable and creeped out about it. My childhood home isn't particularly old, but had been owned a few times before my parents purchased it in their late twenties. We're not religious, and I don't know who or what she could be. The house would feel oddly empty without her, and I like the small signs of her there. I do wonder, however. So me and my family, mother, father and sister, all moved into our house seven years ago. Now it was a council house, and the last tenants got kicked out for general bad behaviour. And basically, since the start, the house has always had odd things going on but nothing harmful or annoying. There were the more stereotypical things like extremely cold spots and odd smells that we could never find the source of. The funny thing is my sister joked about the ghosts the whole time. Then stuff would go missing for lengthy periods of time and then just kind of appear in a very obvious place, like days or even weeks later. For me, it was a PlayStation controller that disappeared for like a week and then was just on my bed one day. And for my sister, it was a necklace that was gone for a good few weeks. Then she saw it on her bedside lamp when she came home from work. 
funny story about one of the more recent happenings too. So my sister came to me asking if I had been in her room. She had heard footsteps and just felt like someone had been in there. I was just playing a game the whole time and she went to bed. Now the next day, I spent most of my time in my room, but apparently in the living room, my mom saw a girl or a woman just walk out of the room and it freaked her out. But at the time, she only told my sister. That night, I was in bed watching YouTube when I could smell hair. Like when you're lying behind someone and their hair is in your face. It was so weird. So I started looking around and could just feel like someone was watching me from the foot of my bed. No one was there at all from what I could see, but I just knew someone was there. Eventually I got tired and went to sleep facing the wall. The next day, I was told about the thing with my mum and then my dad chimes in saying he'd been awake all night thinking someone was in the house. But those are probably the most spooky things. Most of the time now it's cold spots, shadow people, things in the corner of the eye and just feelings of presence. The really funny thing is that the house next door is really unlucky, as in the last three tenants have had horrible shit happen to them. First guy we know of killed himself. Not sure how, just a rumor from neighbors. Next guy was killed by a drug dealer and his dog. Mom came back from work and saw a massive crime scene and shit. Was questioned about it if she knew him and stuff. Found out about it later from his wife while she was leaving. Horrible stuff. And our current neighbor lost one of his legs while living there. Not sure how. He is quite an older man too, so it's quite horrible. I guess we got lucky getting the haunted one and not the unlucky one. I used to be very skeptical when I was younger, so I chalked it down to a number of non-supernatural things. But at this stage, everyone in the house has kind of accepted that we have someone living with us. We even reference them in conversation and joke with them like they're coexisting. Hopefully they don't see it as mocking. We just don't really care because they seem benign and harmless, even if they sometimes borrow stuff. So for setting, this story took place when I was around three or four. My mom, a woman who strongly denies ghosts exist, is the one that told me of this encounter. Apparently, this had happened several times throughout my childhood. I'd repressed much of it, so I don't remember anything from it before the age of 10, but I always get a familiar feeling when I see photos of her. Anyways, on with the story. I was able to talk and play, but on this specific day, my mom had left me to play alone in my playroom while she went to the kitchen to make lunch. The kitchen was on the other side of the house, but she kept a baby monitor in my playroom so that she could keep an eye on me while she had to do other stuff around the house. At first, she didn't think much of it when she started to hear me talk and laugh. She figured I was just using my imagination. Wanting to witness this for herself, she came back to my playroom just to peek in for a minute. That's when my mom said she started to get an odd feeling. So she popped her head through the crack of the door and she saw me looking up at something as I spoke again. I had called the thing that I was looking at grandma. Confused, my mom asked me who I was talking to. So obviously I smiled and said grandma. Only for mom to tell me that both of my grandmas are at their houses. But she said, I then gave her a confused look and said, no, the one in the pretty red dress. The only photo any of us have framed of her is a photo of her in her late 60s from before she died, wearing a long red dress with white lace at the neckline. My great grandma died before I was even born. Like I said, my mom doesn't believe in ghosts, but to this day, she gets uneasy talking about it. And every time I see a photo of my great grandma, I feel a sense of familiarity, like I knew her. My name is Nancy Poitou. A colleague referred this case to me. In this case, there was an apartment building where there was a mother and daughter who lived in a loft. The daughter woke up one night to see a black man standing over her bed. The little girl's mother told her therapist, who told her about me, and she told the apartment manager. 
The therapist gave her client my contact information and she passed it on to the apartment manager. By this time, the mother and daughter had both moved out. Oddly enough, the date I was asked to do my ghost busting thing landed on Halloween. I asked a friend of mine to come with me as I usually do someone who's intuitive and spiritual to do with this with particular ghost busting events. The apartment manager had done some research and discovered that the building was very old and many years ago it was a courthouse in jail. I appreciate any information that I'm given about the place I'm investigating because I'm not out to prove anything to anyone. I just want to help the people who live there and the ghost or ghosts as in this case. My friend Maria and I got there and met with the apartment manager who took us up to the loft. When I walked in, I quickly realized it wasn't just one ghost, but closer to a dozen, which surprised me. I said this to the apartment manager and asked if she wanted to say. Her response was something like, oh, hell no. I laughed and she took off. I was taught to never ever be afraid in these situations. If the entities are negative, they will feed off fear. And when I go to do ghost busting, my intention is to help all those living and dead to find peace. I find that when coming in this intention and energy, I don't encounter any problems, at least not so far. So the first thing I used to do is investigate, meaning walking around the property in an altered state and see what I pick up while my friend does the same. She agreed there were more than one and probably a dozen ghosts inhabiting the space. What I saw in my mind's eye were that we used to call hobos. Hobos were men who were homeless, especially during the Great Depression, and who rode the railroads by covertly hitching a ride in the 30s and 40s. As a young girl, I remember warnings from my mother to stay away from the railroad tracks. I didn't understand why at the time, but my mother who lived through the Great Depression as a young girl knew about hobos. Just like today's homeless, there are some who can present a danger. I much later realized mom wanted me to avoid hobos. One definition of hobo is a migrant worker or homeless vagrant, especially one who is impoverished. The term originated in the western, probably northwestern United States around 1890. Unlike a tramp who works when only forced to, and a bum who does no work at all, a hobo is a traveling worker. Along with the dozen or so hobo ghosts in the former jail was also a policeman. I could see the jail cell and the hobos in, in the policeman all talking, telling stories and joking. I was surprised to find that it did not seem like a prisoner guard relationship that I would normally expect. It seemed more friendly and informal almost, like the guard was there to supervise rather than guard dangerous prisoners. Because the dozen or so hobos were earthbound spirits, it occurred to me that although possible, it was unlikely that they all died there. The apartment manager who did some research did not mention any events that would have resulted in them all dying there at the same time. But for some reason, it seemed to me they came back perhaps because it was a friendly, warm environment in what must have been some pretty depressing lives. Many years later, I learned that back in the 30s and 40s, police departments would open their jails for these hobos to have a warm place to sleep and a meal. I didn't know this at the time I was visiting this loft, which is why I was somewhat confused by the energy of the relationship being so friendly. Once I determine what's going on in a location, I then attempt to communicate with the ghosts or earthbound spirits. Until I'm shown otherwise or experienced otherwise, I assume that the souls that are stuck in a place between our physical plane and the next, which ghosts or earthbound spirits. An earthbound spirit is a soul that has died and in some cases doesn't know what they, doesn't know that they have died. Sometimes earthbound spirits have died under very traumatic circumstances. They're scared and confused and unable to perceive the light. And so are unable to make their way into the light and get to the portal to the other side. What earthbound spirits need in these cases is someone to help them find the light, the path to the other side. Sometimes they need to tell their story and that alone can release them from being stuck between worlds. Some earthbound spirits are just unwilling to move on to the next place for one reason or another. Sometimes it's a guilt, a horrific loss, a traumatic death, or simply being very attached to a place. Souls don't always stay at the place where they died. 
They sometimes go back to a place where they have good memories or where an important life event of good or bad happened. This was my conclusion about the hobos. The energy felt camaraderie and acceptance. My next step is to go into an altered state to communicate with the ghosts. There seems to be no re reason other than the camaraderie and positive feelings they had about each other and the location that drew them back here and was keeping them there. My friend Mar Maria did a ritual to open a portal. I laid down on the cement floor and went into an altered state. I think of it as entering into their space. I think they telepathically know I'm there to help because I usually encounter very little resistance. I communicated with the policeman who was wearing an old fashioned police uniform with the kind of hat that was flat on top with multiple straight edges around it and a shiny brim in front. I mentally explained that they seemed stuck there and told the policeman that I was there to help them move on. I then asked him to lead the way through the portal. He hesitated, saying that these men were his responsibility and he, he went first. He was not sure they would all follow him. So I said, okay, and have them go through the portal first so you can make sure that they all go through before you step through. So the policeman told the hobos to line up. I was surprised that they were so compliant and got on a single file line, each one putting his right hand on the shoulder of the person in front of him. I mentally asked them to look for the light and directed their attention to when Maria opened the portal. I said it may look small at first, but keep your eyes on the light and it will get closer and closer. And so in a line they began to walk through the portal and lastly I saw the policeman follow. It's at that point that the spirit guides and loved ones of the earthbound spirits can then take over, guide them into the afterlife. Having been a hospice volunteer, I've seen people have deathbed visions where guides and relatives who have passed on before them come to get them. But sometimes in the case of the earthbound spirits, their vibration is too low for them to see the light. Spirit guides, friends and relatives. That's where the need for someone like me comes in so that I can get them to a point where they can now see the spirits who are there or at the portal. My next step in ghost busting is now to remove any negative energy and to raise the vibration of the place. So first I use a smudge stick, which is a Native American tradition to remove negative energy. It is made up of dried and bundled sage, in some cases sage and cedar. You light the end of it with a lighter, allowing it to burn for about 30 seconds, and then you blow out the flame and it keeps smoking. As a white person, I use a turkey feather to direct the smoke. Native Americans use, these other, use other kinds of feathers, like eagle feathers, which are not only to be used by Native Americans. I use the feather to direct the smoke of the burning sage as I walk around the house or apartment, or in this case, the loft. Since there were no furnishings, I focused on walking around the inside wall, smudging as I go. The next step in removing negative energy is the use of unrefined salt. I sprinkled a little salt along the inside walls of the loft. The salt will soak up any remaining negative energy and needs to be vacuumed up in a couple of weeks. My next step is to raise the vibration. This is like changing the energetic address. This is what keeps earthbound spirits from returning to the place. I do this by first burning incense. This is what keeps earthbound spirits from returning to the place. I use resin, incense, and again use a turkey feather to direct the smoke of the incense around the inside of the walls. There are other things one can be used to raise the vibration like classical music, spiritual symbols and photographs or artwork of positive spiritual images or people. Another step is to use the frankincense oil. I have a little jar which I'll dip my finger into it and say a blessing over the doors and the windows, making a cross with the frankincense oil. I sometimes leave behind a copy of the prayer of protection. But in this case, because the loft was uninhibited, I only used the incense, the frankincense oil and meditation. In the meditation, I say the prayer of protection and visualize a white light enveloping the domicile. I also usually use a white candle, the kind that is in a tall jar. I anoint it with frankincense oil and light it while saying the prayer of protection. But again, because this place was empty, I didn't want to leave a burning candle. 
If it's an occupied home, I'll give the occupants instructions about vacuuming up the salt and letting the white candle stay lit until it's burnt all the way to the bottom and goes out on its own. I instruct the occupants that when they leave the house to put the candle in a shower or bathtub, where even if it's knocked over, it won't start a fire. Allowing the candle to burn down to the bottom continuously, I don't want the ritual to be broken. So rather than have it broken, I didn't in this case use a white candle. Marie and I did the meditation. The more people who join in, the more power it has. So when there is an occupant, I will also involve them in the meditation. When I do a ghost busting session like this, I offer a money back guarantee. The reason I do this is because I want to know if what I'm doing is working or not. And as I said, in the beginning, my intention is to help both living and dead. And if I haven't been able to help them, I don't think they should have to pay for it. The next day I spoke with the apartment manager and told her what had gone on and what I discovered. I told her about the money back guarantee and if there were any more problems to please call me. She assured me that she would. It's been years and I haven't heard from her, so I wouldn't say it was a success. I couldn't think of a better way to spend Halloween than just do some real life ghost hunting. So I'm living in the house that I grew up in and this has happened for years and I've just always brushed it off. But until my wife brought something up about it, I thought I was crazy. So the house is a two story country home built in 1973 and it's only had three owners, my great grandfather, my mother and myself. So no way is there a fact that someone who we didn't know passed away there. The only death that has ever occurred in this house was my great grandfather in 2005 who died in the room I sleep in from lung cancer. I was always terrified to stay in my room when I was younger for one particular reason. The door would always slam shut if it was cracked or fling open when it's halfway open. Let me give you backstory. My great grandfather always hated doors not being one way or the other. You either have them opened or closed, no in between. I barely knew the man so I couldn't tell you why this is. So I feel as if it's him doing this, but I couldn't be sure. Another weird thing is that a main air duct is located behind one certain door in the main hall that lets much of the heat or AC in. Constantly opens as if someone wants to use the heat or AC they're paying for. And this will happen at random. If it's on or off, day or night. And the weird thing is it doesn't just fling open. My wife and I have both observed the doorknob turn and open as if someone's opening it. It's crazy and I'll have to try and record it. The final thing that's weird is that my basement door, which has a slide lock and a door lock on it, in which I double check every night to make sure it is locked, constantly opens in the middle of the night and I can hear it creak open, weirdly, in my dreams occasionally. I see him in my dreams, but I have no idea what's causing all of this. One day, I was sitting in my living room to the right of where I was sitting is the door that leads to the kitchen. All I had to do was lean forward to look into the kitchen and I could see through the kitchen to the back door. I was also able to see in the opposite direction, the front door. So I'm sitting there and I hear the back door open and close. I lean forward and look, but I see nothing. I hear footsteps that sounded like men's boots. As usual, rather than visually see something, I see it in my mind's eye. What I saw this day was a cowboy. He walked straight from the back door through the dining area, through the kitchen and stopped at the doorway right next to where I was seated. It felt as though we sort of looked at each other and shrugged. Okay, I said to myself, that just happened. And then he continued to walk through the living room and I heard the front door open and close. Neither the back door nor the front door move, but I know the sound of my own back door and my own front door when they open and close. My house is not haunted and this had never happened before or since. From knowing the history and the city I live, the area where my house is was a very long time ago, the red light district. So it's my conjecture that this cowboy was looking for the brothel. When he didn't find it, he just kept on walking. It seemed obvious to me, or it felt to me like he could see my house and he could see me and was somewhat confused as I was in the moment. I was taught to never be afraid of ghosts. 
Because if they were negative entities, they would feed off the fear. I've never been afraid, startled maybe. They're never afraid. So this was just one of those things that happened. That was interesting, but I was not the least bit frightened or upset. It was just a day where a spirit walked through my house, looking for the brothel. 